Hey everybody, welcome back, Nevin, the OG, the original Grognard, and we are back at the table. What are we taking a look at? at? Bougainville, Forgotten Campaigns. I think this is actually the first game that has been done as a collaborative effort between Lock and Load Publishing and War Diary Magazine from the design and development progress all the way up to publication. Um, Lock and Load Publishing has got a, a, a very nice working relationship with War Diary Magazine. We, we publish... Uh, a lot of their games and well their magazine not so much their games but uh, they're definitely their magazines uh and they've got a really war diary magazine has got a really great deal that if you subscribe one year to their to the magazine i think it's like 38 dollars a year for a subscription you also get to choose any one of the battle on demand games i think we've got like Ooh, I don't know, 15, 16 of them so far. And I know we've got three more that are coming out very soon. Or you can just buy them as a Battles on Demand game direct from Lock and Load Publishing. So, Bougainville campaign. Uh, invasion of Bougainville was part of Operation Cartwheel. The objective of this Allied operation was to neutralize the major Japanese base at Rabal. Rabal was already within Allied heavy bombing range, but a closer airfield was needed for the shorter range bombers and fighter escorts. With his objective in mind, the entire island of Bougainville would not have to be completely occupied. The mission was to establish forward airfields for strikes on Rabal. The second phase, conducted by Australian troops, took, troops took a more aggressive approach with the aim of mopping up the pockets of starving and isolated Japanese forces. Bougainville, the Forgotten Campaigns, is a two-player game. One player contains, con controls the Allied forces, U.S. Marine Army and the Australians, and the other player controls the Japanese Army and land-based naval forces. So, there you go. Take a look at the complexity. Complexity is two. Solitaire playability is five. Age is ten up. One to two players. One to two hours playing time. Uh, producer, David Heath. Associate producer, Roy Matheson. Uh, map art, Michael Taylor. And there you go. Game development, John Heim. All right. So, let's just go ahead and jump into this. Um, it's Bougainville. It's the island of Bougainville. Each hex is about seven miles. Uh, units are pretty much brigade and uh, battalion size. Um, and of course, since the Japanese are defending, the Japanese do start set up. And you will, if you will notice, they, they do have a hidden mechanic, hidden initial placement mechanic, and well, just a hidden mechanic for playing the game in general. Kind of pulls the solitaire suitability down a little bit. Um, several of the Japanese forces have uh, specific hexes they have to set up in, and uh, there is a small handful of forces that can set up anywhere, and there are a couple dummy counters out there. So basically what I did is the units that had to be set up in hexes, well, I had to put them, but the ones that, uh, that could be placed anywhere, I just kind of shook them all up and randomly placed them out there. So I, I, since I'm playing against myself, I, I really have no idea what the dummy units are, which, you know, is, is good for, for trying to maintain that fog of war. Uh, and the Japanese do have some reinforcements that appear on turn one. Historically, like most island fighting, yeah, that wasn't much. Yeah, the, the Japanese were left to wither on the, whoa, wither on the vine for the most part. My camera goes screaming all over the place. There we go. Uh, so this, they do get some uh, reinforcements on turn one. Uh, the U.S. forces, let's go ahead and zoom, whoop, zoom back out. So we can take a look at the uh, American forces. Uh, they start off, uh, the Marines, 3rd Marine Division starts off the game. That's the initial landing forces. These guys only stick around for two turns. By turn three, they're removed and they are placed with the U.S. Army forces from uh, 93rd, 93rd Division. Yeah, 93rd Division. Um, and then on turn seven, the American forces are removed and replaced by Australian forces. Uh, 3rd Infantry Division, I believe. Uh, and there's, you know, there's artillery support and armor support. So you've, you've got a little bit of artillery and armor in this game. Um, but yeah, at the, end, at the end of the day, it is your standard zone of control, odds ratio. You know, here's the combat results table. Fractional combat results table. Round down in favor of the defender. Um, but the, the cool thing about this, well, obviously, uh, is the chrome. What chrome is there in the game? We've seen zone of control fraction games all over the place. They've been pretty much around since day one. Really what you're getting down to is what chrome is included in the game. Well, let's take a look at some of the chrome. First of all, the U.S., or not the U.S., the Allied forces have a close support marker. 
zoom in on that. It's a close air support. It can be used as close air support or at the beginning of every turn, the American player can decide if he wants to interdict basically the Japanese farms for su supply and support. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, you have the option of, uh, of either using it as close air support to give you better odds in combat or better defense in defense, or you can use it to try to harm the Japanese supply lines. I think that's a pretty cool decision to make. Uh, the 93rd Division, uh, between turns four and six, when they're on the board, um, you can actually spin this marker, flip it over for a turn to reduce w one extra level of fatigue out there. Again, that's something I'll get to. Uh, we have a amphibious, a US, um, USMC amphibious flanking attack. And really, this is pretty much just good on the first turn, and I'll, I'll get into that. And then there is Australian amphibious flanking attack available when the Australians can come on board. Um, what a, little a little flash in chrome we have is Green Island. Green Island with Green Island, yes. Some, something happened with the phone. It turned off on me. So Green Island was a little island not too far off Bougainville that the Japanese used to, uh, to as, as, as uh, it was food. They have rice patties there. I mean, they were using it as a food source. So, hey, it's great if the Japanese had, unfortunately, on turn four, the U.S. invaded it. And on turn four, it turns over into the U.S. hands. And, uh, yeah, they, it affects the Japanese supply. You're going to see a lot of things. <laughs> Farming Japanese supply. I mean, you know, it's historic. I mean, if you take a look at the turn record track, uh, the initial invasion was 1143, but, you know, it, it went until August of 45 when the Japanese finally surrendered. And by August of 45, you know, they, they were cut off and pretty much left to die on the vine. Japanese high command couldn't get any reinforcements to them, couldn't get supplies to them. So the Japanese army on the island was, was in a really sorry state, as happened with most island hopping campaigns. Uh, a little bit more flashing chrome we've got. We've got the Buin Road. Focus in on that. The Buin, Boin. I apologize. I'm probably butchering that. Basically, you have... The uh, port village of Buin down here. And you can see these solid lines that are right outside of it going to the Kara airfield and then going up to Hari. Those, those are roads. And then you've got these dotted lines, which are trails. Well, it's obviously easier to move through roads than it is for to move through trails. And if the Japanese want to, they can send, spend some of their supplies to push basically the road network out. And it's basically one supply per hex that they push the road out. Although, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm, I don't see the Japanese player doing that very much. They don't get a lot of supplies and you need the supplies to keep your people fed. But it's a cool little mechanic uh, included in the game regardless. Uh, there's also barge movement for the Japanese player. And basically once per game, they can take a unit that's at a port, be it uh, Kita or down in Buin or one of my favorite one here, Numa Numa, uh, and then Buis up north. I basically can take a unit that's in a port and automatically move it to any other port. Um, and they can do that once per turn. So you got that. That's There you go with that. And then you got the victory point and supply chart over here. Japanese start off with one supply point. Their stockpiles, and every turn they get to roll a D6, and uh, there's a few modifiers. Let's take a look at the chart right there. Focus. Focus. Why is this not focusing? There we go. Um, you roll a D6, add in all the modifiers. You can see the modifiers right there on the right. Minus one if Green Island is under U.S. control. Minus one if there's U.S. Air, if the U.S. is using their air as interdiction. And minus one for each farm garden allied controls. I'll show those on the map here in a little bit. Uh, but you roll a D6, and that's how many supply points you get. So you, at best, you're only going to get three supply points. That's in the later stages of the game. That's not enough to keep your people going, which is okay because in the later stages of the game, I think it's on turn seven, um, the Japanese really start suffering from malnutrition <laughs> and, and lack of supplies and, and their, their, their offensive combat capability it tends to go down a little bit. Well, we might get there. We might not. Um, and then we got Japanese and U.S. victory points. There you go, allied victory points, Japanese victory points, and they just go right on that track on the right-hand side. You start off at zero. You've got a eliminated units box right there. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that. Whoops, not make it brighter. Zoom in. 
uh, eliminated units, and then victory points as they occur. I do want to point these out. Um, so the Japanese get one victory point if they do a turn one counterattack on the landing forces. They also get one victory point the first time they, atta they attack a USMC unit. Uh, they get one victory point every time, the first time they attack a U.S. Army unit. They get one victory point if they can successfully, well, not even successfully, as long as they can get artillery range and bombard the beachhead airfield. Uh, they get one victory point the first time that they attack two Army units, and then one victory point for each, ar each enemy unit eliminated. Really tough to do, and we'll get into that. Uh, once per game, the U.S. player will either get seven victory points or five victory points, depending on how the beachhead is laid out, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And then at the end of the game, a uh, number of victory points for friendly or for owned victory locations. And let's get into that victory. Oops, stop doing that. I need a better camera system. All right, so you take a look on the island, and you're eventually you you will occasionally see hexes that have got the Japanese flag in it and say one victory point. And well, there you go. It's one victory point if you control that at the end of the game. Two victory points for Buin down here. And I also want to point out, you're going to see hexes that look like this, and those are village hexes, but you need to be aware that there are also hexes that kind of also got these boxy things on them. Those are supply locations or, or uh, uh, just rice patties where basically the Japanese are trying to grow the food that they need to actually survive. So that is a lot of the onboard... Um, chrome for the game now let's actually before I, I actually start playing this i do also want to point out there is kind of a, a little bit of a restriction for the allied forces and again it's 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 kind of keeping with historically what occurred now historically the americans decided to land it was either in this hex 0408 or 0509 it was in empress augusta bay one of these two hexes you as the allied player can land anywhere you want the thing that you have to keep into, in, in, in mind, though, is that the American units, be it U.S. Marine or U.S. Army, can never move more than two hexes away from whatever hex ends up being the beachhead hex. Now, I'll get to that in a little bit, and we can kind of see. Now, here's the beachhead hex side, and then when you flip it over to the airfield side, so the U American units have to stay within two hexes of that beachhead basically for the entire game as long as they're on board um as i kind of mentioned before uh the marines are removed on turn three and the army unit and the army units come on the army units are removed on turn seven when the australian units come on and then the australian units don't have any restriction on where they can move basically as i kind of read in the little prologue at the very beginning the idea wasn't they didn't need to conquer the entire island they just needed to put in a beachhead and secure perimeter, and that was it. The, the, the Americans had no intention of invading the island. The Australians, when they, got, when they finally took over control, it's like, yeah, okay, now we're going to go out and see what we can, what we can capture and what we can, uh, what we can kill and you know, basically see if we can suppress the entire island. But for the first yeah, well over half of the game until turn seven, American players are going to be sitting in their perimeter. The Japanese are going to be trying to counterattack. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Uh, but that is one thing you do have to keep in mind. So basically, the last five turns are the turns you have to try to capture as much territory with the Allies as you, as you can. Do you really need to? Mm, not really. Again, as we pointed out... The U.S. player will either start off with seven or five victory points for, wherever the beachhead, for when the beachhead is put into play. What's the difference in point values? You have two types of amphibious landings. You've got a regular amphibious landing, which is a peaceful landing uh, that you can do in any empty hex as long as it is three hexes away from a Japanese airfield or base. If you go with one of those, you're kind of limited to kind of this section of the island right here along the western coast. Pretty much everything else is within three hexes of a Japanese airfield or base. Okay, so that is just an amphibious landing. If you put the beachhead that way, you get seven victory points for it. Or... You can land your troops, take the Marine, the 3rd Marine Infantry Division, and land them right into combat with an enemy and just do it as an amphibious assault. And then 
you don't have the same restrictions as you had with the amphibious landing. You can, you can basically do an amphibious assault anywhere uh, as long as you're landing on, you know, on a hex that has an enemy unit. And there are, you know, depending on where the extra, because the, some of the Japanese beginning units always start off in like Buin, Numa Numa, Kita, uh, or Buis up north, Buin in the south. Um, so those are coastlines that you can land directly upon. Let's go down here again. So that, that you can land directly upon. You can do an amphibious assault there. You can do an amphibious assault there. Or not there. Yeah, well, there, because that's 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 adjacent. Uh, an amphibious assault there. You could not do an amphibious assault here because you're not attacking an enemy unit. Uh, actually, you could do an amphibious landing there because, let's see, the closest base would be way down here at Hari. So yeah, that's more than three hectares. And again, historically, like I said, the Americans landed here because Emperor, em Empress Augusta Bay had a little bit more uh, uh, protection from the wind. Um, and so they decided that would be you know, the, the, the best place to land. You as the American player can land anywhere you want. So that's the difference between uh, getting five victory points or seven victory points for the beachhead landing. So it comes down to, well, do you want the Marines to do what Marines do and uh, you know make the grass grow? Or do you want to have a more peaceful landing and, yeah, you get more victory points for it. But also by the same token, if you're doing an amphibious assault, I mean, you are going to be capturing Buin, which, or, you know, you could be going after Buin, which is two victory points. Kista is one victory point. Numa Numa up here is one victory point. So you can kind of make some, a little bit of the, the, that seven victory points back if you do an amphibious assault. Now, again, you got to remember that as soon as the American forces land, the American forces are locked in place and can move no further than two hexes away from where the beachhead hex is. And basically, when you plant the Marines, you also plant the beachhead. And I'm, <laughs> there are rules in play for uh, if the Japanese or if the, if the American Marine are unable to take, however... Uh, take a look at the Marines because you throw all three Marine units on. I mean, you're looking at 18 attack factors. The largest attack factor that the Japanese have is a four. So you're looking at four to one odds. And then you've got your air support, which you can throw in for a plus one, uh, a plus one on the dice roll. And then you can use the USMC amphibious flanking attack available, which is another plus one dice roll. So yeah, I, 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 you, I haven't really actually ran the numbers, but it's going to be really hard for the Japanese player to stop a naval invasion. Um, and so you, you put the beachhead on that. Say, say, for example, we wanted to have our Marines land there. We would put all the Marine units plus their artillery unit. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they've got their artillery unit. So that's even three more points. So 6, 12, 18. That's 21 attack factors plus a plus two on the dice roll if they use the flanking attack, which... Why wouldn't they? It's the only time they can use it. Um, and the uh, close air support for another plus two versus, you know, at most a four. You're looking at five to one odds plus two on the dice roll. Let's go ahead and take a look at the chart. Yeah, five to one on and with a plus two. You're going to be hurting the Japanese in some way, shape, or form. But if for some reason it doesn't happen... There are rules governing that the beachhead coming in later. But again, like I said, that's how you get the difference between the seven points and the five points for the, uh, for the beachhead hex. I know I'm kind of going a lot over a lot of the chrome, but a lot of the chrome needs to be explained before I actually get into the mechanics and the playing of the game. Now, I have no idea what the Japanese have. I don't know where they're located. I mean, I got a kind of a vague idea. I remember, okay, I think this is like uh, down here in Buin. I think that's a 4-3 infantry. And, you know, just because I remember from the setup uh, that, that those units go there. But the units that are kind of placed all over the place, I have no clue what they are. How am I going to play this? Very difficultly. <laughs> I'm going to the, the lowest movement that the Japanese have on their units is a two. The highest they have is a four. So for these units that I can't see, I'm just going to give them an arbitrary movement value of three until I get to the point where I'm going to be able to reveal them. Once they're revealed, I'm going to keep them revealed forever. So, I mean, that's kind of what you have to do with this kind of this hidden mechanic in play. And of course, you know, if there's a dummy unit there, then, uh, you know, I get when it 
flips over, I'll just, you know, have to remove the dummy unit. So that's kind of uh, most of the mechanics. We do have a couple other counters. We've got fatigue markers. So you can take fatigue in combat and you can bleed this off. Uh, the U.S. player can bleed it off as at the beginning of their every one of their turns as long as they have a unit that's within uh, uh, line of sight, or not line of sight, uh, can trace a movement path back to wherever the beachhead is. Um, and then you've got these step loss half strength units. Um, U.S. units have two, two sides. They've got the front side and they've got the back side. And you can kind of see they've got this red line through them to tell that that's the half strength side the japanese since most of well all of their units have got the unknown on the back it's kind of tough how do you keep track of those them taking half steps that's what this half step marker is for uh there are fortification markers both the japanese have fortification markers and the u.s marines have fortification markers and the u.s army has fortification markers um fortifications work uh, were kind of cool in this game i, I kind of like how they work in this one um it's, it's a minus one to the dice roll if you're attacking into it so i mean not that big of a modifier but it's enough however uh, fortification markers are only removed if an enemy moves into it to eliminate it. So even if you force the enemy back, and a lot of times the U.S. are going to force the enemy back, but because they're within two hexes of the their beachhead, they can't follow up the attack. So, and I discovered this through my own play, the Japanese fortifications are just going to stay there because, well, I can't move that third hex away to move into the hex to destroy it. You know, I got to stay within two hexes of the beachhead. So the Japanese fortifications, once they go and play around the time when the Americans are, are playing the are on the board you're not going to see your fortifications <laughs> removed unless you put it you know like one hex away from the from the uh, beachhead within their movement capability um one other thing about the beachhead the, the u.s loved to be able to move around freely so regardless of where you put the beachhead everything within two hexes of that is considered a road hex so say you landed right here uh, let's see where's my beachhead let's say we have the beachhead right there and the airfield right there, all hexes within two hexes, all hexes within two are considered road hexes. So the U.S. can really move around a lot easier. It doesn't matter if this is deep jungle. That's still two hexes. That's a road. It's got a road on it. A Mount, what is it? Balby? Okay. Uh, that's going to consider it to have a road in it. So, all right. I think that's, and like I said, a lot of chrome. And I like the chrome in it. Um, so let's go ahead and sit down and play out a couple turns just to kind of show off what's going on. I don't know if I'm going to make more than one video of this. Uh, once you see the first couple few turns, you're going to get the idea of the mechanics behind the game really quick. So I'm not sure if it's, it's, it, it would behoove me to, uh, to do more than one video to just show off the basic mechanics and you can, and then you can make your decision on your own if you want to purchase the game. Again, I will give my typical caveat. This is not a how to play video. This is not a how to play playthrough. This is just me, you know, Norman G, ordinary war gamer, just playing a game, reading it from the rules that I, as I understand it, I'm going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes when we play games. It's just the way it is. So this isn't me trying to teach you the exact 100% mechanics of it. This is me playing it, comprehending from what I've read, and hoping that it gives you some entertainment and you get the idea that, hey, maybe I want to buy this game on my own. So anyways, so let's go ahead and decide. How are we going to decide what we want to do? Well, first of all, since I don't know where any of the Japanese forces are, um, I am not going to specifically pick. I'm just going to kind of randomly roll, and we're going to we're going to pretend that this is all right. Yeah, I'm I'm third marine, uh, but I'm being told by, yeah, Comnav Sync Pack. This is this is this area is where we want you to land. You 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 take over the idea from there. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to decide if we're going to invade on the north end or the south end of the island, and then the east side or the west side. So we'll do one, two, three. For we'll land at the north end of the island. Four, five, six. And we land at the south end of the island. All right, five. So we're going to be landing on the south end of the island. And we're going to go one, two, three for the west side of the island, four, five, six for the east side of the island. And having that information, three. So it's going to be on the west side of the island. So with that information, it pretty much is, is this coastline right here. 
Now, we have to... Uh, I would say Buin is on the eastern side because it's kind of past the, the halfway point here. So not going to be able to land on Buin. So that means I can't land within three hexes of a base or an airfield. So one, two, three. So I can anywhere right here in this area right here. So we're going to say that's where we're going to be able to land. Now, am I going to do an amphibious assault or an amphibious landing? Well, there is no units that are on the coastline that I can amphibiously assault. And let's move my map up so we can see where we're landing at. So it's going to have to be an amphibious landing. So that And that will have to be within at least three hexes away from a base. And we already know where the bases are. That's a victory point, but that's not really a base. Um, bases are more marked by the ports. Let me check that just to make sure. Is a victory point a base? Because that uh, that definitely. Mm, I hate going to the. Everybody knows I hate going to the rule book because it slows down gameplay. Okay, bases. Those are just set up locations for the Japanese player. Okay, so uh, this would be considered a base. So I can't have to be more than three sexes away. One, two, three. Although you know, really, if you take a look at it. Even by their own rules, I shouldn't. Historically, they landed here, but they didn't land. Well, it could have been that the Japanese had 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 landing or had troops there. Um, so one, two, three. Okay, so really looks like these two hexes are the only two hexes in the area that I'm going to be able to land at. And you know what, Cape Torokina. Tori 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 I'm going to butcher these names horribly. I apologize. I think we're going to make Cape Torquina the, the landing point. So what does that mean? Well, we take all three of our marine units. We take the uh, artillery unit and we play, take the beachhead. Let's, this, is, this is before it's flipped. So let's go ahead and place that right there. And then let's take the three units, the three marine units, and their infantry unit. And we land everything right there. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the sequence of play. I mean, there's there's three steps to the sequence of play. You've got movement, combat, second movement. So not much in the way of uh, of of many phases, but you do kind of have to keep an eye on what's in each phase. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the initial phase uh, for the allied player. Uh, oh, yeah, I have to determine what type of air support. So, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll put it on interdicting of farms. Um... Place the 93rd Infantry Division in the 93rd box if available. It is not available, so we will not put that there again because you can see it's only on between turns 4 and 6. Receive any reinforcements this turn. That would be 3rd Marine Division. Uh, if the Japanese player is the phasing player, they check the status of Green Island. And, and we don't have to worry about that till turn 4, but the Japanese player is not the phasing player. Um, Japanese player rolls for supplies and then receives any reinforcements for this turn. So that's just the initial phase. Pretty quick, easy to go through. Uh, first movement phase, the phasing player reduces fatigue exhaustion levels. The player may move some, all, or none of his units with the limits of restriction of the rules for movement, zones of control, weather, and terrain. Now, that's kind of interesting. It mentions weather in the rule book, but there's no weather charts or anything anywhere. I think it's something that was intended to be in originally, but was uh, but was removed. Um, then fortifications may be built. Phasing player amphibiously lands units, use barge movement, and bring reinforcements on the map as allowed by the reinforcement schedule and the reinforcement rules. So that's basically what we did. We, uh, we did the uh, amphibiously land. Well, we did amphibiously land these guys. So they are on the map. Uh, so now we go into the combat phase. Uh, player uses his units and air and or artillery support to attack the non-phasing player units. Phasing player may declare and execute his attacks in any order he desires. Japanese artillery may bombard the allied airfield. Defender may use artillery support during the combat phase. No unit may move except one call for as a result of combat. Oh, one thing I did want to say, there are a few uh, artillery units uh, in the game. Uh, this is kind of an artillery unit. It's more of a beachhead defense. Um, but they can use their combat value in e in both attack and defense so the artillery gets to be used twice per turn so if you want to, if you plant an artillery unit and sometimes they have a, they most of them yeah let's take a look at this this u.s army unit if you notice it's got this two right here that's the range so as long as an attack or a defense is happening within two hexes wherever that unit is at it can throw its 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 support into one attack per turn and one defense per turn but what have we got? Okay, so we're going ahead and landing everything. So we're going to attack, 
And because I'm going to attack, and obviously the only unit I can attack is that unit right there, we'll flip it over. It's a dummy mark. Ooh, helps if I actually zoomed in. So let's start that over again. So the only unit we can really attack is this unit right here. Um, so we'll go ahead and attack them, but... Ah, it's a dummy unit. So we go ahead and remove that. Removed from the game, no worries. So that basically is combat. There was a dummy unit there. That we thought there were troops there. There actually weren't, so I'm not actually making a combat. So now you have your second movement phase, which is identical to the first movement phase, except for you can only move along trails, roads, or make a minimum move. And a minimum move is basically moving one X. So we need to go ahead and push out the perimeter so let's just push out the perimeter. And Marines can only make a minimum move on the first turn. So let's go ahead. Ninth Regiment, 2nd Regiment, 3rd Regiment, and then we'll leave the, uh, the beach defenses in the, in the, in the beachhead hex. Um, now, I'm not attacking this unit, so I'm not going to reveal it yet. I'm only going to reveal whenever I attack a unit or if I uh, uh, am going to, quote-unquote, attack with a unit. Um, and so basically that's it. That, that is the U.S. turn. Pretty quick, pretty easy, huh? And well, you just flip it over. Japanese turn. All right, so Japanese turn. Again, it goes through the uh, initial sequence of play. And really the only thing that the Japanese have to worry about on the initial sequence of play is, uh, I think it's reinforcements and Green Island. And Green Island only flips on turn four. Uh, air support, 93rd. Oh, and the Japanese player rolls for supplies. Um, so, what does that mean? Well, we go to this chart here. Rolling supply points. So, take a look. Green Island is U.S. controlled. No. Air interdiction. Oh, I've got a piece of hair on, the, on there. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Air interdiction, yes. Uh, the U.S. player did decide to use air interdiction with our air support, so that is going to be a minus one dice roll. And then each farm garden allied controlled, I don't have any farm gardens that I currently occupy. So the only modifier that's going to be on here is a minus one. Roll the dice real quick. And we rolled a four, and a four on the chart is two supply points. All right. I haven't really gotten into what the Japanese use supply points for, but I will. But they get two supply points, so they're now up to three supply. So, uh, then we go into first movement, and the Japanese do have reinforcements according to the scenario that we were playing. There are two scenarios uh, in, this, in, in this game. One of them is the entire campaign, and the second scenario is uh, when just the Australians come on and, and get to do their thing of, of kick-ass and take names all over the place. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look real quick at what we can do on turn one for the Japanese. Uh, we've got an amphibious landing in any eligible hex with the 2-4 dude. Uh, which one is it? It's the 17th. There we go. So this guy, I can do an amphibious landing with him. So let's set him off to the side for a little bit. Um, I've got a 3-2 uh, that can land at any Japanese port. So that can land at any Japanese port. Well, let's see. Uh, I think we're going to land it at Numa Numa. And now we're going to be getting into a little bit of stacking issues. But as soon as I get everything placed, we'll talk about stacking. And then the last three units, two infantry units and the artillery unit, either in bonus or Numa Numa. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take the artillery unit and put the, have him land at Numa Numa as well. We'll go like that. And, okay, so stacking basically is one unit per hex, unless it's one of these light green hexes. Light green hexes can have two units. Every other hex can only have one unit. Artillery and armor do not count towards that value. So you can have one artillery, one, in, uh, one armor, and two infantry units in a green hex. In any other hex, you can have one armor, one artillery, one infantry unit. So stacking is fairly easy. So these two guys can come in. And so basically, I've got them upside down, so I don't know exactly where they're at. Uh, let's go ahead and this guy land up here at Bunis. And the other guy land down at the southern port of Buin. And they are maintaining stacking because it's no more than two units 
in a uh, jungle clearing or jungle plane sex. So that's the reinforcements. Now, uh, oh yeah, I've got this guy. I can amphibiously land them anywhere I want. And for the Japanese, I can just drop them in. I can't do an amphibious assault, but I can do an amphibious landing. Um, and the Japanese don't have any restrictions on where they can amphibious land. So you know what? They're just going to go ahead and land right there. And just for posterity's sake, a proprietary sake, I'm just going to keep him flipped over, even though I know he's a 2-4. Just because that's what we're doing with everybody else. All right, so that's that. Now we have movement. All right, well, let's see what we want to move. I think we want to move this guy. And again, I'm just going to say that we have a default of three movement points for units that are flipped over. Now, again, if you're playing against an opponent and he, uh, the Japanese player knows what his movement is, well, then he's going to move his movement. But since I'm, you know, kind of got this fog of war going on, I'm just splitting the difference and saying they get three movement points. Now, moving along a trail is one and a half. So we'll go one and a half, three. Okay, so he makes it there. Um, let's go ahead and move this fresh infantry that we just got. One and a half, three. And these guys at Pora Pora, one and a half, three. Uh, let's take a look at the Southern Island. Let's keep those guys there. These guys, one and a half, three. Move them up a little bit. Oh, you didn't see that. Yeah, that's <laughs> these guys are right here, one and a half, three. Uh, these guys, one and a half, three, one and a half, three, and then one, because that's a, that's a trail, and two and a half. So, basically, two axes. Uh, I will keep him there, we'll keep him there, we'll keep him there. I mean, we don't want to get too overextended, because again, U.S. forces aren't really going to be expanding much. They're kind of just going to be sitting, you know, right where, <laughs> within two axes of the beachhead. All right, so, now, what we're going to do... Okay, we got some attacks going on. We've got to do some attacks. Uh, remember, the, the Japanese get one victory point if they do a first turn counterattack, and they get one victory point as soon as the first time they uh, counterattack a Marine unit. So we're going to take these two units here, and we're going to flip them. Ah, poo. All right, so we're going to attack this Marine unit. This is not going to go well. Now, the attack value, there are two numbers on here, attack value and movement. First number is attack value, second value is movement. Now, unfortunately, this guy's number is in white. And if you also kind of look at it, let's go ahead and get a close-up look at this, if the camera will cooperate. You'll notice that that is a special naval landing force for the Japanese. That's their, that's their naval infantry. I loathe to call them Marines because they technically were Marines, but not on the level of U.S. Marines. They've got a white number. They cannot initiate an attack. So that's a little bit depressing. So it comes down to this little unit right here. Or I could do down here. Well, I've already flipped these guys. So let's go ahead and do this one up here first. Um, now remember, I get one victory point for counterattacking on the first turn. I have to do that to get the victory point. So something's going to get attacked. I could attack down here, and we may do that as well. Um, plus, I get one victory point for attacking a Marine unit. Marine units are only on board for really two turns. So you're going to want to get some early attacks off on them. However, it's two to six, which is one to three odds. So, but you know what? It's for a victory point. Let's go ahead and do it. We're going to one to three odds. There is no combat modifiers. <laughs> it's a six, which is about the best that we could have hoped for. So, morale check. All right, so this is a little bit something different that we don't see in a lot of CRTs like this, is the concept of the morale check. Now, for the morale check, the defender always checks morale first. And what happens is basically you roll a D6 versus whatever their morale value is. Well, for the Marines, their morale value is a six. So if you roll a one, two, three, or five, the Marines are fine. If you roll a six, they break, and then it turns into a DR, which is defender retreats. Um, all, other, all other American units, are their, their morale value is equal to their combat factor, and the same with the Japanese, that their morale value is equal to their combat factor. So, the, oh, you can, yeah. so basically, the Marines, I need to roll a 1 through 5, and I'll be fine. Okay, so I rolled a 2. I'm fine. Now, since the defender passed his morale check, the attacker now has to check his morale, which is a 1 or a 2. And they rolled a three. They failed it. Now that turns into an attacker retreat. So the attacker has to retreat one hex. Pretty simple. Now, whenever you engage in combat, you're fatigued. So you just basically put a fatigue marker. 
Now there is another step after that, which is exhausted, and that could come in through uh, through combat results. But for the most part, anytime you're fatigued or anytime you attack, you're fatigued. If you attack again when you're fatigued, you still remain fatigued. Like I said, exhaust only comes into into play with certain conditions uh, when the Japanese supply really starts tanking, um, or through combat results. But first turn, I counterattacked, and I the first time I attacked a marine. So that right off the bat gives me two victory points. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm very okay with that. Um, now, do we want to make the decision if we want to attack with this guy down here? You know what? Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and attack with it just because. Ah, uh, three to six. All right, so this is a little bit better. Now it's one to two odds rather than one to three odds. And there is no combat modifiers. Really the only combat modifiers, if you're attacking into a uh, rough jungle, a steep jungle, a mountain, or you're attacking across a river. Really, those are the only places where you have uh, combat modifiers, and most of the time, it's just a one-column shift. Uh, the steep jungle hexes, which are you know, basically these these lighter brown ones. Actually, nobody can go into the mountains, so oh, there you go. Um, the, the the steep jungles is, is, if you're attacking into it, it's a one column shift and a minus one on the dice roll. So, but as it stands now, we got three to six, which is... Uh, a one to two odds. Now, normally I have an artillery unit here at the beachhead. However, it doesn't have a range of two. So I can't add in their combat value uh, into that into that attack. So it's going to be one to two, no combat modifiers. Maybe we'll get another good dice roll and maybe do something to the Marines. We got a three, probably not. One to two, it's a three, it's an AS. Okay, and what does an AS mean? Attacker stopped, no effect. Now, again, this is something kind of cool that you don't see in a lot of uh, uh, combat results tables, fractional combat results tables. Nothing happened. Uh, it wasn't an exchange. Sometimes, usually when you get to, to, to those mid-level ranges, you know, like you roll a three or a four or in one-to-one -one odds, it's usually an exchange or something like this. But for AS, is attacker stopped, no damage. Neither side takes damage, no morale checks or anything. Now, the Japanese do have to get marked with a fatigue marker. We'll do that right there. And that's fine. But... You know, there we go. I, I could have had something. Let's see, at, at one to two, if I had rolled a six, it would have been defender retreated. So I had to push the Marines back and could have pushed my pushed my forces forward. Now, if if for some reason in in a, a, a defender retreated or even, a, I don't think attacker retreated, but defender retreated, if they leave the hex open, the attacker can occupy the hex. So that's that's standard in most uh, fractional games, uh, fractional CRTs that we see like this. Um, but yeah, basically right now, yeah, that's good. I think we're. I think we're just gonna. Well, there's no other attacks I can do. Um, so now I know for a fact that I've got an artillery unit here. Okay, right here, he's got technically has a range of two, which I could have thrown into this combat, but yeah, that's okay. Had uh, what would that have made it? That would have made it four to. That would have made it a one to two odd. Um, had the Japanese player been played by an actual human being, then he would have caught that. But, you know, as it stands now, I've got the fog of war. I'm just ignoring what is there. So maybe it's not optimally, uh, uh, the Japanese, uh, man maneuvering in combat. But again, what am I going to do? I mean, I could flip everything over, but then that kind of takes away, you know, the fog of war and, and really the only thing keeping the Japanese forces in this game, in the game, um, not because of the hidden units. Now, so, so combat is over. Next, we have another movement phase. Um, and again, this movement can only take along uh, trails, roads, or minimum move. And what you can do at the beginning of every movement phase... You can put in fortifications. Now, the U.S. can put in fortifications. It doesn't cost them anything. They, they're they limited to... Uh, the Marines have three. The Army has three. You're limited. The Japanese have five. So what I am going to do is I am going to go ahead and throw a fortification down right here uh, because we know the, the Japanese are going to want to move into that hex and occupy it. However, by doing that, does cost me a supply point. So I move my supplies from three now down to two. So... Uh, so that fortifications is done at the beginning of movement. Then you have your normal movement. And so let's just go ahead and move these guys. Oh, I can't move those guys into there because that would be overstacking the hex. So, all right, we'll just leave, we'll just leave it right there. If you 
build a fortification, you can't move. So yeah, we committed ourselves to that. So that's that unit is probably going to get blown out of the water, and then that unit's just going to have to end up following up into it. Um, but I've got other units that can do a minimum move, or I can do. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and try to flank the beachhead. Let's take this guy and do a minimum move to there. Uh, let's take this guy. Since we're fighting along the plains here, I can get two in there. So let's do one and a half, three. Let's do one and a half, three. And I may take this guy around to try to get into the jungle so I can try to flank these, uh, the, the American units. Uh, one and a half, three down here. Uh, one and a half, three, because that's maintaining the long trail movement. Keep those guys there. Keep that guy there. He moved. We'll keep them in Numa Numa. I just love that name, Numa Numa. Sounds like some type of, some type of pop song from the 80s. Numa Numa, whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be it. That's going to be it for turn one. That's going to be the Japanese forces. So we're going to go ahead, flip this over to turn two. Uh, well, we're pushing 45 minutes. Let's go ahead and pump through this turn real quick. Um, so 93rd Division does, it doesn't happen. I need to decide what I want to do for my air support. Um, now let's keep going with interdiction. We don't like the supplies. Uh, USMC amphibious flanking attack. Yeah, I'm already on the beach. I don't need to worry about that. Green Island isn't captured yet. And okay, so there's that. Then you look to see if you get reinforcements. Reinforcements are real easy. You just check the turn track, and if there's a star, something happens. May not uh, may not always be uh, receiving reinforcements, because like on turn four, it's the, the Japanese uh, shift the Green Island status. But on turn three, you get reinforcements. So whenever there's a star on the turn record track, check the scenario. That'll tell you what happens on that turn. All right, so now for me, uh, remove any exhaustion markers. I don't have to remove any exhaustion markers because I didn't attack anything. So none of my guys are, are, not, are not exhaustion markers, fatigue markers. Um, so, and now I can move my first movement. Um, let's... Yeah, let's push uh, ninth, uh, ninth Regiment forward a little bit. That kind of leaves an open spot there, but I do have defense. I do have... Oh, at the beginning of the second turn, or the turn after the beachhead being placed, it gets flipped over. So now it is a five defense, and plus we've got the three beachhead defense right there. So we've got eight defense on the airfield. And as you can kind of see from the combat factors, Japanese have really got to come up with a lot to uh, 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 destroy the beachhead. I will say that is one way that the, ja the one way the Japanese can win before the end of the game is if they can eliminate the beachhead. Um, so, but we flipped it over. Now we got to determine was an amphibious landing or an amphibious assault because that will determine how many victory points received from it. It was an amphibious landing because the Marines didn't attack anybody. Therefore, we get seven victory points. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that was a big jump. So the Allies have seven victory points, and the Japanese have got two. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're kind of leaving a hole right here. We don't need to worry about that because we've got plenty of defense there. And I think we're gonna have the Marines actually. No, we'll leave the Marines there, and we'll leave the Marines there. All right. So basically, that's movement. I've, I've only got three guys, so it's not that difficult for me to figure to uh, figure out what I'm doing. All right. So combat up here. We are gonna have the Marines. Uh, we're gonna do six to a two which is uh, three to one odds. Now, the Japanese are fatigued. Nothing happens on the defense when you're fatigued. If you're, a, on, if you're fatigued and you're trying to attack, it's a minus one dice roll. However, the Japanese are defending and they're fatigued, no effect. If they were exhausted, that would be a different story. And we've got six to two, it's gonna be three to one odds. So I no other modifiers, I'm not attacking across a river, not attacking into jungle rough or jungle steep. So three to one, and I get a three. Take a look at the chart real quick. Three to one, three is a DR, which is defender retreats. All defending, all def all retreat one hex or remain in the hex and suffer one step and one fatigue. It that only uh, effect applies if they're in a fortification. They can remain in the hex if they're in a fortification. Have take one step loss and one fatigue. However, they're not. So you know what? They're going to go ahead and take the one retreat. Now, a hex was unoccupied. He, he vacated the hex. However, I can't move there because it's more than two hexes away from the beachhead. So I pushed him back, but I can't capitalize on it. 
I'm just maintaining the perimeter. High Command says, I can't go any further. I'm stuck right there. All right, fine, I can't follow up. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next one. Right here, we've got six to two, which is again, one to three or three to one odds. However, I'm attacking across a river, which is a one column shift, so it's two to one odds. And I'm attacking into rough jungle, which is another one column shift. So now it's one to one odds. And he's in a pillbox, or he's in fortifications, which is one minus one to the dice roll. Probably not the smartest attack I've ever made, but hey, I'm playing the Marines and you know, I, I love the Marines to death. You know, they 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 don't know the meaning of the word quit. Granted, they don't know the meaning of most English words, but they you, you know do have 74 ways they know how to F you over. So <laughs> It's going to be a one to one odds and it's going to be a minus or yeah, minus one on the dice roll because they're in the Japanese are in the fortification and we got a two minus one is a one. Chesty Puller is not going to be happy with this. One is an AR and an AR is attacking retreat or no ARL AR uh, attack retreats one hex. All right. So that's fine. You know, didn't lose any losses. I did end up end up moving back one hex. So we're going to go ahead and retreat to there. Um, and I should point out that since they both attacked, they get fatigue markers. And let's go ahead and put this on the bottom of the stack. So we don't think the entire stack is uh, fatigued. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and do the other attack right here. This is six to three. It's going to be two to one odds. There's no modifiers on that. So this should be a little bit better. Uh, five on two to one odds is a DRL. And let's take a look at the DRL real quick. DRL, defend all defenders take one step loss, retreat one hex, and take one fatigue hit. Oh, well, we haven't seen that before. All right, so what does that mean? They take a step loss. Well, first of all, since we can't flip them over to their other side, uh, because they don't have another side. We use the step loss half strength to put it on there. They retreat one hex. Let's go ahead and retreat them right there. And they take a fatigue hit. Well, they're already fatigued. And this is what I was talking about earlier, is that the only way really you can get too exhausted is through combat. They're fatigued. They take, a st they take another uh, fatigue hit. Now they are exhausted. That unit has been beat up pretty bad. Can we recover them? Eh, maybe. All right, now. Defender re, uh, cleared the hex. It's an empty hex. This time, the Marines can advance because it's still within two hexes of the beachhead. And since they attacked, they get a fatigue marker. There you go. Simple as that. Um, so basically, the that was combat. Then we go into second movement. Um, you know what? The two Marine units that are out on the flanks... As this is a normal movement, and you can put a fortification down uh, if you don't move at the beginning of a movement phase, we're going to go ahead and dig in right there. Uh, we don't really need to dig in here. Um, first of all, it's really close to the air base, and uh, I would think that the the, air, the Army Air Corps pilots coming in would want the perimeter pushed back more than like three and a half miles, because remember, each hex is seven miles big. So yeah, it just, it just keeps random shots away from the air, airmen as they're coming into land, pilots as they're coming into land. All right, so that's basically the uh, U.S. turn. That's it. I, 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 I'm not moving anymore. Oh, I mean, I technically, I, well, I could. Yeah, I can move back up. So let's go ahead and move back. And you know what? Where, where we want to move to? Let's move to here. It's because we found that way. Well, no, we could get cut off there. No, let's, we're going to have to move there. Because I don't want the Japanese getting in and uh, kind of blocking my path back to the, uh, the beachhead because that means then I won't be able to get resupplied and remove my fatigue. All right, so then flips over to the Japanese turn. Japanese turn. Initial phase, uh, really the biggest things we got to look for is supply. And again, it's just like it was in the first turn. We take a look at the Japanese supply table. Uh, is Green Island U.S. controlled? No. Is there air, air introduction? Yes. Each farm garden ally controlled? Zero. So we've got a D6 minus one. And we roll a one and get a zero. And that is really not good. They get one supply point. Not good at all. So they take their supply number. And supply goes up two, three. All right. 
beginning of the movement phase. Uh, now, this is where fatigue and exhaustion go away. Now, for the, uh, the U.S. forces, during their uh, initial phase, or no, during the first movement phase, not the second movement phase, during your first movement phase, you get rid of fatigue. For the U.S., as long as you can draw, tra- draw a line of supply unimpeded back to your uh, beachhead landing, you get to remove one level of fatigue. The Japanese, however, they got to spend supply to get rid of fatigue. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and spend one supply point here to get rid of his fatigue. And then let's go ahead and remove uh, one to get him. You know what? Let's keep him exhausted. I don't have the supply. I'll move him back. I got a couple other units coming up, so I can pull this guy off the line for the time being. Um, yeah, Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and spend one at least to get him down to fatigued. And we're going to save one supply point. Um, so we've got one supply point. Um, now, what are we going to do? Movement. Uh, first thing I can do is fortifications. They're fine with that fortification. I don't want to put any fortifications there because the allies are kind of at the, at the uh, extreme end of their, their movement. Uh, so we're basically going right into, right into movement. So let's go ahead. First thing we want to do is pull that guy back. Let's go, Ooh, let's go, that's a one half one. Let's have both of these guys just waiting right here. Um, let's not, 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 let's not poke the hornet's nest until we can get multiple guys ready to go in there for an attack. Uh, up here, let's move this guy here. And again, I don't know what there is. I'm pretty sure one of these are a uh, special naval landing force and they can't Attack on their own, but let's go ahead and move them up anyways. Uh, we don't have to worry about st- we don't have to worry about stacking there because it's a uh, uh, jungle plains. Up here, let's move this guy off the line. He's got four movement points, so it's one and one one and a half three to move him back. And again, fortifications do not get removed until an enemy unit moves into them. So then we're going to go ahead and move these guys in here now. Is there a reason that I'm moving forward and pushing forward and trying to trying to poke the uh, uh, poke the Marines? Well, I don't have to. I know that they're not going to be able to move to more than two hexes. But you know, it's he's fatigued, which is you know it really mean. Well, I, uh, you know, it's a fortification. Yeah, let's do it anyways. Let's kind of circle around and and kind of uh, nibble at them. Oh, we can move this guy here. So that that's guy. We could do an attack from there so let's we'll take a look at that but not that and we might do an attack here but yeah i think everybody else has moved i think we're good with that um so that's the end of movement goes into combat you know what let's go ahead and let's let's try this like i said i'm fairly certain one of these is a sniffle ah yep there it is there he is he's a sniffle so he's not going to be able to attack but the two is going to be able to attack that's going to be one to three. Okay, and a minus one. Now, you know what? I'm not going to attack with that. I'm not going to attack at one to three odds. We'll just leave those guys exposed there. So, now see, an actual Jap- a player playing the Japanese would have known which one of these was the uh, sniffles and wouldn't have moved them in and probably would have moved him up. But, you know, it is what it is when we're playing solitaire. Um, and these guys here, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead and attack here. Probably one of these guys is a sniffle as well. Yeah, oh, artillery. That's oh, that's right. I moved the artillery down there. And these guys, oh, they're the sniffle, so they can't attack. Poopy. But we do have artillery right here. So we've got three, four, five against six. It's going to be one to two odds. I'm attacking across a river, which will be one column shift. And I'm attacking into, you know what? They're not going to attack either. <laughs> I'm just revealing. I just don't have the forces. And I will just go ahead and leave that like that. And he's there. And then we've got no attacks down south. So that's going to be it for combat. Um, and let's move on to second movement phase. Uh, let's go ahead and move that artillery unit back because it's got a range of two. So we'll move that there. Let's move this guy into here and move that unit into there. And there's one and a half and then three, because we're just saying, all right, all units have got, all hidden units have got three. We'll leave them. That's a good defensive position. Um, I mean, they're on a mountaintop, so, you know, that's fine. We're, we're good with that. Uh, and these guys down here, no, I do not want to move them up yet. 
Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. That, there we go. Turn two done. And then we're going to go ahead and step into turn three, but we're going to go ahead and call this here. Um, I have not played enough of the game, I think, yet, so I think I probably will be doing a second video on this. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section below. I'll talk to everybody later. See ya!